In the grand scheme of Broadway shows, there are countless hits that have well-earned Tony Awards. But for every show that works, there are even more shows that fail. Sometimes they have a lousy score, lousy book, or a combination of the two. But what's really frustrating is when a show is pretty good, but is geared toward the wrong audience. That is what I think ultimately happened with Raggedy Ann, aka Ragdolly. I had made a video a while back about the Raggedy Ann movie that was meant to segue into this video, but it wasn't terribly well polished or organized, and I think combining the two subjects into one piece will be better, so let's take it from the top. Raggedy Ann was a character created by author Johnny Gruel, inspired by an old rag doll his daughter Marcella played with. There's a story that the doll was created to help Marcella cope with an illness that later tragically took her life, but in modern times this is apparently seen as something of a myth that has shaky historical evidence. Either way, Gruel wrote dozens upon dozens of stories about the magical adventures of Anne and her brother Raggedy Andy. These fantasy tales spawned several animated adaptations, and yes, a Broadway show. But before we get to the show itself, we need to look at the movie it was based on. The 1977 film, Raggedy Ann and Andy, A Musical Adventure, was first conceived as a live-action Hallmark special. When this was deemed too hokey, it was decided to make it an animated musical directed by Abe Levitow, who previously directed Gay Paris and Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol. However, Levitow passed away early on in production, and the animation supervisor, Richard Williams, took over. Richard Williams was quite possibly one of the most talented animators of all time. He was the kind of person who could be told, eh, give us a cartoon based on that Ziggy comic, you know, the one that's occasionally funny. And not only is the cartoon he delivers well animated, it's actually got a ton of heart as well. Even his TV commercials are meticulously drawn. And that's not even getting into his work on The Thief and the Cobbler and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So yes, we had a master working on this one. A master who admittedly went way over time and budget and ended up getting fired near the end of production, but still a master nonetheless. The plot is as follows. Marcella owns a group of kind of creepy dolls, and their optimistic leader is Raggedy Ann. On her birthday, Marcella receives a genuine French doll named Babette. Captain Contagious, a pirate who lives in the nursery's snow globe, falls in love with Babette and lustfully kidnaps her, venturing out into the woods toward the open sea. Anne and Andy set off on an adventure to rescue Babette. Along the way, they run into a lonely camel who is desperately searching for a home and family, to the point where he hallucinates an entire camel caravan in the sky. While giving the dolls a ride, he blindly chases his hallucination, leading them into a pit inhabited by a taffy monster called the Greedy. The Greedy himself is starved for love, looking for a sweetheart. Unfortunately for the dolls, he takes the idea of a sweetheart literally, and attempts to extract Anne's own heart which happens to be made of candy. The dolls fight off the greedy and move on in their quest. Almost immediately, they meet the insane Looney Knight who traps them in his home, Looney Land, ruled by the cruel King Koo Koo. The king is tiny and is embarrassed by his small size. He can only grow big if he's laughing at someone else's pain and wants to keep the dolls as his prisoners, torturing them for laughs. The dolls escape and head to the ocean, where Babette has seduced the entire crew into starting a mutiny against the captain. Now decked out as something of a dominatrix, complete with a whip, Babette orders her pirates to set course for France, and is not happy with the idea of Raggedy Ann and company rescuing her. To further complicate things, King Koo Koo returns for revenge alongside a giant sea monster named Gadzooks. He sadistically orders Gadzooks to tickle everyone into submission, laughing at them and ballooning to enormous size. Andy gets a bright idea, and has the captain's parrot pop the inflated king, which blasts everyone back into reality. Marcella finds Raggedy Ann, Andy, Babette, and the captain outside her house, but doesn't notice the camel who's lying just out of sight. In an actually pretty heartwarming ending, Raggedy Ann lets the camel into the nursery that night. Marcella enters and is initially confused by the new addition, but quickly embraces him as her own. The animation is undoubtedly the movie's strongest suit. The detailed characters are often incredibly fluid in their movements, to the point where it's almost mind-blowing. Highlights include Raggedy Andy's dance number early on, a black and white chase through Looney Land, and the superfluous but very impressive encounter with the Greedy, which is probably one of the coolest and most nauseating animated sequences of all time. The cast is also solid, with Dee Dee Khan as Raggedy Ann leading the way. A lot of people will probably remember her best as Frenchie from Greece, but she'll always be Raggedy Ann to me. Mark Baker as Raggedy Andy seems to be the fan favorite, however, with a lot of comments about how surprisingly sexy people find his voice. You're just crazy! I'm no girl's toy! Maybe lazy! 
Watch it, sister. The problems start to arise with the score and the script. The score was done by Joe Raposo, who is best known for the songs he wrote for Sesame Street. Classics like Sing, Be in Green, and C is for Cookie. He worked on several other Jim Henson productions as well, notably The Great Muppet Caper, where his song The First Time It Happens earned him an Oscar nomination. Outside of The Muppets, his numerous compositions include the score to Halloween is Grinch Night and the theme songs to Three's Company and Shining Time Station. The songs he wrote are mostly quite good. They're memorable and catchy, but he wrote so many of them that it becomes overwhelming pretty quickly. The movie runs a little under an hour and a half, and it has about 15 songs, give or take a few brief ones. Thus, while the songs are pretty high quality, you find yourself wishing that everyone would stop breaking into song and move along with the plot. Even some of the better songs like Blue and Candy Hearts and Paper Flowers start to overstay their welcome. When you're wrinkled and cold And your fortune has all been told and you're nobody's I love you. For comparison's sake, let's look at Beauty and the Beast, one of the best animated musicals of all time. If we are not counting a few short reprises, the movie only has six songs, or seven if you're watching the extended edition. Each song serves a purpose. If it's not driving the plot along, it's studying the characters. The only song that doesn't really affect the plot is Be Our Guest, but every musical should be allowed one or two of those let's sing because we can kind of numbers. The Raggedy Ann songs, meanwhile, stop the story cold. King Cuckoo says he's short, and then sings a song about how short he is. The Captain is in chains and sings a song about how he's still friends with his parrot. This stuff goes nowhere. You're my friend. You're my friend. I like you. I like you. I like you. Cause you're my friend. You're my friend. The script suffers a bit as well. While the characters are fun and the plot is your basic adventure road trip kind of movie, it does meander quite a bit at times. The opening scene in the nursery leading to Babette's seduction really drags on. There are six songs before Raggedy Ann and Andy leave. And as stated before, the greedy sequence is ten minutes long and contributes nothing to the plot. Apparently, even Richard Williams is aware of how pointless the whole thing was, but refused to cut it due to how much work it had been put in. With that in mind, I wonder how it ever made it past the drawing board if it added nothing to the plot in the first place. Another problem is that although the characters are lovable, they're not given enough to do. The camel with the wrinkled knees gets one of the best songs called Blue about how alone he is, and the ending scene where he's accepted into the toy family really does tug at the heartstrings yet he doesn't actually do anything helpful in the plot. Raggedy and Andy themselves are just flung from place to place, and don't do much either. Queasy the parrot ultimately is the one to defeat the evil king. We have a trio of protagonists who, despite their charm, don't quite deliver what they promise. All that said, I really do love this movie. Yes, it is a flawed film. The characters don't get a chance to do enough, the plot feels half-baked, and the all-too-numerous songs just pile on after a while. And yet, I find the whole thing utterly charming in spite of its issues. The voice actors do a wonderful job, the animation is eye-boggling, and the songs are usually great when they're not wearing you down. I'm actually going to admit that this is my favorite animated feature film of the 1970s. That may be somewhat faint praise, since animated movies were somewhat slim pickings back then. Disney only released four animated films in the 70s, and their Winnie the Pooh feature was mostly old footage, with only about two minutes of original animation. Unless you were Ralph Bakshi, times were hard for animators then. In 1981, director Patricia Snyder approached Raposo to adapt the movie for stage. The first attempt was ideally for community theater or school productions. It was simply titled Raggedy Ann and Andy, because this version had all the songs cut. Let me tell you. Without the songs, the story really does fall flat. Just to be clear, although I have criticized the number of songs in the movie, I wouldn't want all of them cut, just some so it wouldn't bog down the whole production. In 1984, however, playwright William Gibson, who was best known for writing The Miracle Worker, was brought on board. He wanted to tackle the story from an entirely different angle, focusing on the struggles that the real-life Marcella faced. Raposo agreed, and because the plot was so radically changed, an entirely new score was written, with only two songs from the movie remaining, Blue and Ragdolly. The story now focused on the ill Marcella, 
who joined Raggedy Ann, Andy, and the other dolls on an adventure to cure her sickness while being stalked by supernatural villains. The show hit a bump in the road pretty quickly when premiered in December 1984 at the Empire State Institute for Performing Arts. Gibson had written a considerably darker interpretation of Raggedy Ann's adventures, and an outraged mother complained to the local news about how disturbing she found it. As a result, a school that was planning to come for a matinee canceled their field trip. Thanks, lady. The show was retooled and premiered again in October 1985, without as many publicity issues. In January 1986, the show was performed in Moscow for an extended arrangement with the entire original cast along for the ride. Despite most of them having to cram in some quick Russian language lessons, and there being something of a language barrier when it came to set building and the orchestra, the show was a rousing success. A half-hour documentary called Rag Dolly in the USSR has been uploaded by Raggedy Ann's actress Ivy Austin, and I'll be sure to leave a link to it. It's a wonderful look at how theater really brings cultures together. It gets a little syrupy at a few points, not unlike Raggedy Ann herself, but honestly, we need some more syrup and positivity in the world. If you want to restore your faith in overseas relationships, and humanity for that matter, by all means, give it a watch. For the Moscow production, the show was performed in a mix of English and Russian. The characters would deliver their lines and then speak a few key phrases in Russian to help the audience understand what was going on. The audience, kids and adults alike, were enthralled. It makes sense. The basic plot about a sick child escaping the personification of death with magical companions feels very much like an actual Russian fairy tale. With such an overwhelmingly positive response from Russia, I imagine the cast was excited when the show came back to the States to be performed on Broadway. Sadly, the show received negative reviews and closed mid-October 1986 after only five performances. Now that I've detailed the show's history, let's take a look at what's arguably the most interesting part. The contents of the show itself. While many Broadway flops are scarce in their content, there's actually a decent amount of material for Raggedy Ann out there, luckily for us. In addition to demo recordings of the songs, there's also live audio recorded from one of the Broadway performances, and of course, the footage from the USSR documentary. Allegedly, there's more B-roll footage out there, and there's even rumored to be a taping of the entire show, but I can't find any real confirmation for this. The New York Public Library also has a relatively early draft of the script in its archives. I heard that one can purchase a PDF of the script, but when I personally wrote to them, like half a year ago, I never heard back. What I'm saying is, we do at least have a good idea of how the show went. So here, for your pleasure, is a recap of Raggedy Ann's plot. If any of the original cast is watching this and has corrections to make, please let me know. Because in fairness, there are a few points where I don't know what is going on based on the audio. After an intro song by a Greek chorus, we meet Marcella, who has faced a lot of losses in her short life. Her mother has abandoned her and her father when she was very young, for a rat in a Rolls Royce, as her father put it. Her father has become an alcoholic, and her pet canary was eaten by her dog, who then choked to death. The dog is named Red Fang, and her bird has the unfortunate name of Yellow Yum Yum, which is probably the silliest name for a bird I've ever heard, and my sister's childhood friend had a parrot named Thermometer Jones. I'm only bothering to mention Red Fang and Yellow Yum Yum by name, because they're actually somewhat important later on. Marcella has fallen ill and appears to be dying. A trio of doctors are entirely unhelpful, and her father throws them out. To comfort Marcella, he makes her a rag doll named Raggedy Ann. That night, when Marcella goes to sleep, Raggedy Ann comes to life. Marcella accepts this pretty quickly, since the story would go nowhere if she spent two hours freaking out over a magic toy. This version of Raggedy Ann is less generically sweet than her movie counterpart, and is actually pretty in-your-face and somewhat sarcastic at times. I personally kind of like the change. Marcella explains that she's bedridden because she's dying. All the doctors say so. On cue, the three doctors from before pop in, this time dressed as clowns. They launch into a hilariously dark number called Diagnosis, pairing a catchy, upbeat tune with lyrics about a young girl's imminent death.
Of course, this whole thing is Marcel's fever dream, and her seeing the mad doctors gleefully telling her that she's not long for this world isn't far from the truth to her young eyes. The doctors exit, cryptically stating that they must report to General D. Raggedy Ann doesn't buy that Marcel is really dying, thinking this is all in the little girl's mind. She goes on to say that this is Marcel's dream, and they can do anything here. Marcella wants to see Yellow Yum Yum. Raggedy Ann suggests finding Marcella's mother, but Marcella doesn't like that idea. To rouse Marcella out of bed, Raggedy Ann calls on her brother and her friends, introducing us to three of our supporting characters. Raggedy Andy is the first to emerge, and is pretty much unchanged from his rough-and-tumble movie counterpart. After that is Baby Doll, who looks vaguely like a Cupid doll in the show, but I'm drawing her as a Cabbage Patch Kid here. Panda emerges last. Baby Doll and Panda, despite being on stage for a good amount of time, don't have too much of their personalities, serving mostly as one-note joke characters. Baby Doll makes a few jokes about needing a new diaper, and Panda speaks in a stereotypical Asian dialect, spouting mock Confucius wisdom. While I'll defend most of this show, they probably should have known better for that part. Andy is curious about a closet door, which Marcella is afraid to open, although she won't say why. Being Raggedy Andy, he opens the door to reveal the show's villain, General D, which stands for Darkness, Decay, Disillusion, and Done For. He commands the Army of the Dead and wants to add Marcella to his ranks. With him are his henchmen, a ravenous wolf and a flirtatious bat. General D also acts slightly flirtatious with Marcella, ew, even when the bat points out that she's one billionth his age. Apparently, though, it's not quite Marcel's time yet. Andy opened the door early, unleashing General D too soon. He departs, promising to be back at 6 the next morning for Marcella and the dolls. The dolls attempt to form a plan, and in a strange scene transition that I can't quite figure out the logistics of, the clown doctors reappear, once again singing their diagnosis song, and suddenly everyone is in a Miami shipyard dump. Not sure what happened there, but it's implied that General D had something to do with it. They meet the abandoned camel with the wrinkled knees, who no longer has a southern accent from the movie. It now sounds vaguely Yiddish. He almost immediately launches into Blue. While the song doesn't have a lot to do with the plot, it at least fits into the theme of the story. Marcel and the camel are both dealing with abandonment. It's mostly the same as the movie version, just shorter and with Raggedy Ann joining in on the final verse. Raggedy Ann takes charge, saying they owe their lives to Marcella's imagination. They decide to go to the Doll Doctor, who's located in Los Angeles. With a map to guide them, they turn Marcella's bed into a boat, while singing a song called Make Believe. It was originally written as a different number about stopping by Mexico on their way to LA. They made the right choice by changing it. The Camel asks to come along and expresses his desire to be an opera singer. Andy declares him useless, but the Camel is allowed to join anyway. They sail on their boat, and are almost immediately attacked by General D. Instinctively, Marcella calls out for her mother. Somehow they escape and fly into the sky. Soon, our heroes find themselves in what is described as a piece of heaven, where everyone is holding hula hoop-like things for some reason. In a demo version of the song, they see the sun and moon get into a verbal altercation, although this isn't in the Broadway audio. Marcella is told that this is where wishes come true, and she wishes to see Yellow Yum Yum again. The bird appears, singing in a heavenly choir and reciting a rather morbid little poem. Next, Marcella wishes to see her father and mother again, and for them to love each other and be a family again. Her wish is granted, and the three of them stand united for one fleeting second. However, as the musical sequence ends, the mother breaks away, saying that Marcella and her father are a rope around her neck. The parents disappear. It's implied from the audio that General D has something to do with the sudden dour mood. Marcella is understandably crushed, and vows to never forgive her mother. Raggedy Ann tries to lift her spirits, but isn't able to help that much. Raggedy does what everyone at a loss for words does in a musical. She sings. Belting out a variation of Rag Dolly from the original movie with new lyrics, Raggedy Ann promises to do all she can to help Marcella get to the doll doctor. And to the credit of Ivy Austin, she really gives it her all. <laughs>
that point, General D somehow brings them crashing down to Earth, possibly with the help of the Bat, and that ends Act 1. Act 2 opens with the actors having landed in Omaha, Nebraska, guarded by the Bat and the Wolf. The Wolf appears to have a major crush on the Bat. It's also revealed that the Bat and the Wolf were Yellow Yum Yum and Red Fang in their previous lives, before being reincarnated in their twisted forms. I legitimately wasn't expecting that. The Bat suddenly turns her attention to Andy, and bursts into a pretty fantastic showgirl-style number called You'll Love It. She and her sexy bat companions, known in the program as the Batettes, Lily, Morticia, and Elvira, essentially seduce Andy, but it all turns out to be a ruse to steal his map to the Doll Doctor. Once again, General D enters, and based on the dialogue, it sounds like the characters are now trapped in a slaughterhouse of sorts. He shows off his magic ring, which can see everything. He also reveals that he wants Marcella to be his Queen of the Dead. The Bat is incredibly unhappy with this creepy development. The dolls are left trapped, guarded by General D. Raggedy Ann suggests singing the General to sleep, which leads into the incredibly catchy song, A Little Music. The camel, in an effort to prove he's not so useless after all, steps forth and belts out a mock operatic aria, which indeed ends up putting General D to sleep. The dolls snatch the general's magic ring and head out, hoping to use it to find the doll doctor. General D wakes up a second later and is, of course, furious. He orders the wolf and bat to chase after them, but the jealous bat refuses to help. She declares her love for General D, to the wolf's dismay. General D kills the bat, leaving the wolf to howl mournfully over her death. Despite having the magic ring in their possession, the dolls all get lost in the grisly woods, which, according to reviews, were decorated with skeletons. A new character is introduced, a lonely witch who is also lost in the woods. She is considering hanging herself. Raggedy Ann stumbles upon the witch, and also a baby shoe that the witch has, which appears to stir up some bad memories. Marcella and Raggedy Ann reunite, while the witch tries to figure out how to tie a proper noose. The other dolls arrive, and the witch is particularly taken with the baby doll, asking her to call her Mama again and again. The witch, of course, is really Marcella's mother, and sings a beautiful song called What Did I Lose, where she realizes that she threw a perfectly good life away on a cheap fling. Seriously, this is a great song, and if the show had done better, I can see this being covered by multiple artists for compilation albums. What did I lose? When did I lose it? When did the high life go low? And how did I go? Marcella and her mother have an emotional reunion where the mother confesses that abandoning her family was the worst decision she ever could have made. Marcella forgives her. Suddenly, something happens, although it's hard to tell what based on the audio alone, and everyone is once again separated. The wolf appears, although he says he's not working for General D anymore. Not after he killed the bat. I think he kills the mother anyway, though, whose last words are her declaring her love for her daughter. Suddenly, we're at the doll hospital, where the nurses perform a lounge number. The dolls and Marcella are all reunited. 
The clown doctors are there, but they claim that the doll doctor is dead. General D emerges from a trapdoor and announces that the wolf is dead, killed for independent thinking. He then launches into his own villain song, the supremely creepy I Come Riding. While the Broadway audio has General D bellowing it out, the demo version is a lot more subtle, with the song being a hushed poem about a dying soldier embracing his death. The dolls use the Power of Love register trademark against General D and tie him up. The general warns he won't be stopped for long. The real doll doctor arrives, revealed to be Marcel's father, and says Raggedy Ann has the cure for Marcel's broken heart. Raggedy Ann's own candy heart. In an act of love, Raggedy Ann sacrifices her own heart to save Marcella. The next morning, Marcella is awake and completely cured. Her father tells her she dreamed the whole thing, but Marcella isn't so sure. Her Raggedy Ann doll's heart is missing. The father assures Marcella, and by extension the audience, that he'll make Raggedy Ann a new heart and she'll be just fine. So that covers the plot. The whole thing's been described as being very Freudian, and I can see that. It's a really interesting show. Like, going into this, I knew it was going to be really strange, but I hadn't counted on how deep the script actually got. The thing is, despite Raggedy Ann being the focus, it's not really her story, it's Marcella's. The poor girl desperately wants to know what she did wrong to send her mother away, and it's heartbreaking. Literally, in Marcella's case. The whole thing is about her having to forgive her mother. Which she does, but it's even deeper than that. If we take this story as nothing more than a fever dream, no magical singing dolls actually existing, that means that Marcella imagined all of this herself and forgave an imaginary, truly remorseful version of her mother that didn't really exist. For all we know, Marcel's real mother doesn't care about the family she abandoned. But in order to move on and keep living her life, Marcella had to construct this elaborate fantasy just to let go. I swear, students could write entire essays on this show if it was better known. Yes, it has a few flaws. The humor didn't quite always hit its mark. The stuff with General D trying to marry Marcella was probably creepier than originally intended, and I wish the racial stuff with the panda was handled a bit better. But overall, it was solid. So why didn't it work? Broadway. I'm not saying there's no room for experimental theater on Broadway. I mean, Cats isn't exactly a conventional show, but for one reason or another, it ran forever. Now and forever. But Raggedy Ann just couldn't find the right audience. And some of it was because it was too out there for an average patron. The show had a kid-oriented premise at a glance about you know, dolls helping a sick child, and that would turn off most adults without kids. But then the show had all this crazy dark material that might upset some children and their paying parents even more, like that woman who complained when the show was in its testing phase in 1984. William Gibson once said in response to the negative feedback, the style is for children, the content is for me. And I respect that, Mr. Gibson, I really do, but I don't think The Great White Way was the proper home for the show with that in mind. Critics were not kind to the show either, comparing it unfavorably to The Wizard of Oz and Peter Pan. They generally liked Raposo's score, but not much else. But, an uncertain audience and negative critics aside, I think the show does still have a lot of potential. I can see it being done in colleges or even community theaters. The script is really fascinating, and I think it could have a second life if given the chance. Before we finish, I want to talk a little about a few cast members of the show. The director was Patricia Birch, who choreographed quite a few Broadway productions, including the original Broadway runs of You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, for which Joe Raposo did the orchestrations, A Little Night Music, and Grease. Continuing the Grease connection, Birch directed the movie Grease 2, which featured Raggedy Ann's actress Ivy Austin in an ensemble role. Ivy Austin went on to record vocals for many Sesame Street songs, including the classic I've Got a New Way to Walk and Serial Girl. I relate to the serial girl on a spiritual level myself. She also did some English dubbing of the Portuguese cat Tita in the Sesame Street New Year's special. Okay, one more wish. I would like to go to the Catarica, wear clothes, 
e dançar na praia. Ah, you would like to go to Costa da Capariga, dress up in bright clothes and dance on the beach with your friends? Outside of Muppet-related projects, Ivy Austin is frequently heard on the Prairie Home Companion radio show. Another person with Muppet connections in the show was Michelin Sisti. I, I really hope I pronounced that right. I'm so sorry if I didn't. He has been in lots of Henson productions as a performer, either as a puppeteer or a full-body performer. For instance, he played Michelangelo's body in the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, and in The Secret of the Ooze sequel, he played the body and the voice of everyone's favorite party dude. And it would be doing him a disservice not to thank him for his work on Dinosaurs, one of the best Henson shows of all time. Looks like we won't go hungry after all, because we've got coffee from all over the world! Yeah, great going, Gus. Now we'll be wide awake when he chews our faces off! The Raggedy Ann musical has gained a small cult following in recent years. And rightfully so. I found recent clips of a production in Russia, meaning it left its mark over there too. They were singing different songs, but it was clearly the same story. Hopefully someday, more people will truly appreciate this imaginative, fascinating show. Until then, we have a decent amount of material for this musical. Even if it didn't fare well on Broadway itself, it has a place in our candy hearts. <laughs> <laughs>